Hello everyone, myself Prashant Arun. I am an embedded engineer working in an embedded industry. So today let's discuss what are embedded systems, what are the various characteristics involved in embedded systems and what the, the design and development life cycle model of an embedded system is. So let's first see what are embedded systems. Embedded system is a combination of hardware and software designed to perform a specific real-time tasks as you can see in the figure we have hardware so hardware can be your PCB boards along with active and passive components such as KP capacitor resistor LEDs and transistors and other components also so these hardware will be flashed with the software a software is a kind of set of statements and algorithm which is instruct which instructs the hardware to do some specific real time tasks so this you call it as an embedded system together let's see what are the different types of embedded systems now so the first system could be a standalone embedded system a standalone embedded system is a system which doesn't depend on host computer or which doesn't depend on host so such systems are independently functionable for example consider a microwave oven a microwave oven can independently work without any help of any host systems the second system could be your real-time embedded system real-time embedded systems as the name itself suggests, they are time critical systems. Such kind of time critical systems has to meet specific deadlines. If they fail to do so, the system is said to be failed. An example could be your airbag control system. Imagine an, an accident being occurred. So if the car airbag doesn't open at specific time, and think of the complexity and think of the uh, scenarios that may occur so the, 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 it, may, it may, may create a threat to human beings so such kind of systems are time critical so these systems are called as real-time embedded systems and a lot of medical devices even come under real-time embedded systems since they are time critical systems the third system is network embedded systems so these network embedded systems are connected to a network and they even try to communicate to other embedded systems with the help of these networks. A great example of network embedded system could be your mobile phone device. So this mobile phone device can even communicate to other embedded system via the network being interfaced to it. And there are even other uh, components uh, involved in the network embedded system such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, CP, Z, web, another kind of various components which provide the network to the system. The fourth system is the mobile embedded system. The mobile embedded system is the best preferred system. The main reason is due to the portability point of view. Due to its portability, these systems are preferred and they are easily carryable from one place to another place. One such example could be an automotive car and even a bluetooth uh, mp3 players so these kind of systems are easily portable from one place to another place moving further now let's see the embedded system classification based on its performance consider an s1 system this system is just a controller based a microcontroller based system with very less power consumption and uh, just a few lines of code being interfaced to it. It may even have an OS or even bare metal programming. So it, it may even doesn't have OS, just a firmware. So such kind of systems are S1 dot systems. An example for S1 dot system could be a basic wrist watch. Now let's imagine we are adding some more additional features to S1 dot system and uh, that gives us a S2 dot system. In S2 dot system is a microprocessor based system. So this system runs on processor and uh, even as an operating system. For example, Linux based systems. 
So these systems operate at very high frequency of around uh, megahertz to gigahertz and have much more computation power compared to S1.2 systems. So, so an example for S2.2 system could be your setup box. A setup box can be running on any OS, for example, Linux or any other operating system and will have even a human human machine interface in it. So such kind of systems for S2. Dot systems. Now, adding much more power to S2. Dot system provides us S3. Dot system. One such unique feature in S3. Dot system is it has special coprocessors in it along with a microprocessor. Example could be your graphic processing cards. So these systems have very high computation power and they have special hardware engines being interfaced to it. Such systems are even very powerful. So the example of such systems could be an artificial intelligence based robot. So now we saw the classification based on the performance. Let's understand uh, the, 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 the how, what are the different types of embedded systems that we're having around us. So just look around yourself. There are plenty of embedded systems like car, CCTV cameras, refrigerators, air conditioners, speakers, robots, many things. So just turn around yourself. You can see plenty of embedded systems performing some automated specific tasks. In general, embedded systems exist everywhere, each and every place. Embedded systems are the future. So in future, maybe we may have much more complex and advanced systems doing some automated specific tasks. Now, we have got an idea of what are embedded systems and what are the different types of embedded systems. So now let's see the basic components that are being involved in an embedded system. One such component could be your microcontroller unit, your microprocessor unit, or even any SOC based processors. Since we all know all the signals that exist in nature are analog. So these analog signals are captured by the sensors and from the sensors, it is being converted to digital form via ADC, analog to digital converters. So these ADCs could be any kind of ADC, approximation ADCs, flash NPT ADCs, or even uh, any other ADCs. From the ADC, we do some processing based on algorithm that is being designed by the software. And the software gives or instructs the hardware to perform some specific algorithm. Once the performing processing occurred, we have to deliver the outputs via DAT. So, uh, in general, uh, again, we are converting uh, the digital analog signal and we are providing it to an actuator. So the actuators are nothing but movable parts. They are nothing but movable physical parts. The example can be a motor. So these uh, may run based on the sensor uh, inputs. So such kind of uh, external environment interaction can be done with the help of actuator. And our one more component is memory. So we can even have external EEPROM that is uh, electrically erasable programmable random access, random, random memory, read only memory. So these kind of EEPROMs can be externally interfaced in case if we need any kind of additional memory requirements. Along with that, as I told in S3.2 systems, we may have even some additional coprocessors involved in it. So such kind of systems are uh, have very high computation powers and even uh, we have a machine interface. So these human machine interface uh, can provide user interfaces to humans to interact with the embedded systems. Uh, kind of graphical user interface. So these are the basic fundamental components of any embedded system. Now, let's uh, actually uh, look into the various uh, characteristics that are being involved in any embedded system. One such characteristic is the task specific. As we know, embedded systems has to run continuously forever and ever in a loop. They must not stop at any time. So they are task specific systems. And the second characteristic is time frame. 
Previously, I, I, have, I have told you that real-time embedded systems has to meet their time deadlines. So if they fail to do so, the system is said to be failed. So they have timing constraints involved in it. So the third characteristic is the size. The more the size is, the more uh, easy the portability will be. So, the, so that makes the system to easily portable from one place to another place. And size plays an important role when designing an embedded system. The fourth characteristic could be the power. So imagine uh, you are having a remote controller unit and if the controller just consumes drastically uh, power every now and then, uh, then the then you may have the maintenance issue like you have to keep on replacing the batteries every now and then. So it's good that if the embedded system that you have designed consumes as much as less power as possible in your designing. And uh, that is the reason we are having some power saving modes in the microcontrollers like sleep modes, uh, which which just uh, uh, oscillators and then turns off all the peripherals. So those kind of uh, features are available in microcontroller units and even processor units just to make sure that our system uses as, as much as less power as possible. The fifth characteristic could be a security. Nowadays, security has become a major concern due to increasing uh, security threats uh, and vulnerability. So this kind of security feature can be added with the help of encryption techniques uh, like a D SDES encryption technique or even AES 128-bit encryption techniques and there are even much more cryptographic techniques uh, nowadays in the market. So such kind of security is must and then the last uh, characteristic that we are going to see is the self-reset uh, feature of the system. Imagine your system is getting and or uh, due to malfunctioning then the system has to recover on itself. So that is done by the help of a watchdog timer. A watchdog timer will have some specific threshold time limits. If the system reaches beyond the threshold time limits, the system is automatically reset with the help of a watchdog timer. So these are the basic characteristics of embedded systems. Now, so let's see the design and development life cycle of any embedded system. Now, the first step could be the requirement analysis. So this is a crucial step in designing the same system. First, the market requirement analysis has to be done. Like uh, the product that we are developing should be having demand in the market. Only then the product will get sold. So that is the reason requirement analysis plays a crucial step and which has been done by most of the engineers in the early stage. And then uh, coming to the requirement analysis, uh, the requirement documents will be formulated. So this requirement documents uh, will be designed at the time of requirement capturing and then uh, it undergoes a feasibility checks and design reviews. A lot of engineers, a lot of developers, and even a lot of testers will be involved in this design review. They will see whether the, the requirements that will be uh, formulated is feasible in the design or not. So such kind of feasibility checks are being conducted and multiple design reviews are happened in the beginning stage just to make sure the product is feasible. And in the next stage, uh, the designing process happens. In the designing process is split into three stages. One is mechanical design, hardware design, firmware and software design. So the mechanical design may include a kind of uh, CAD design, so the computer aided design uh, for the inner and outer parts of the embedded systems. And then uh, coming to the hardware design, the design of the PCB boards, the design of the circuitry has to be uh, met in the hardware design uh, department. And then finally moving to the firmware and software design how the system should be, how the system is instructed, what are the different types of algorithms being used, everything comes under the formula software design. Now, once these designs are done, every design uh, thing has to undergo a testing. So kind of they, they perform kind of sanity testing to make sure that the design is proper, a kind of unit testing in the early stage, just to make sure uh, which doesn't provide a bug in the uh, ending stage. So after this testing is done, it undergoes an integration. So once the integration is done, you get a proper stable prototype. So once the prototype is uh, being formulated, this prototype uh, is just for the just for the testing phase, and then um, it it is not the final product. 
So this prototype is again uh, being uh, provided to the system test engineering department. So the system test uh, engineers do a kind of uh, system test. Uh, they test as a user. They test as a user. They test as a whole of a product. So once the once the test is being completed, it undergoes uh, again uh, validation happens. So once the validation, if the system is stable, then it proceeds further. If the system is not stable, a bug is raised and it is again back to the developer. So this cycle repeats again and again until the bugs are being resolved, until the major bugs are being resolved. But there are some stages where a few minor bugs, which are not of higher priority, can be released uh, to the plant and then they may be corrected in the further upcoming releases. So once you get a stable system, it will be again reviewed by the project manager whether all the requirements have been met or not. Once the requirements is met and the project manager approves, it finally enters mass production. So this mass production is nothing but manufacturing a single prototype product into thousands, maybe sometimes even more than that. So they may be produced in mass and uh, finally the product are huge. The products are huge that are coming from the manufacturing plant. So the as I told, the final product uh, enters manufacturing plant and uh, production of large amounts of standard products uh, maybe in terms of batch production or any other production technique uh, and uh, every single product which is being manufactured will undergo a kind of quality checks so that is the reason when you see when you when you, when you pick an any uh, new embedded system or any, you know, any kind of new embedded system uh, you will be able to see a kind of a sticker uh, called qc check being attached to the back side of the system so that is the kind of a quality check quality control check that is being performed when the system is being manufactured in the manufacturing plant and uh, this is how uh, an embedded system design cycle works so maybe in the next video I will give you much more uh, information about this. Um, so, if you like my video, please do subscribe it and uh, hit the bell button. So, follow me up for much more uh, videos on embedded systems. And uh, thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you.